help me welcome Professor Adebayo Odukoshi. Junior and uh, Excellency uh, President Goodluck Jonathan, First Lady Governor Obaseki, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, all protocols observed. Um, let me first and foremost uh, express appreciation uh, to His Excellency for uh, the invitation to be part of these uh, proceedings and also the additional honor of uh, being asked to be on the Board of Advisors uh, of the Good Work uh, Jonathan Foundation. I feel really very honored by this, Your Excellency, and thank you very much uh, for being uh, with this, this, this honor. Um, I also would like to um, uh, celebrate uh, our capacity in this country um, to rise above our differences when it really does matter, and have conversations of the kind that help us to pull back from the brink. Uh, this has happened repeatedly in our history, and I hope that on this particular occasion, maybe as a special birthday gift to His Excellency President Jonathan, we will not only have a conversation to pull us back from the brink, but also to begin to define a pathway towards true transformation that will enable us to lead, live to the expectations, not only of Nigerians, but of Africans, or black people all over the world, that our country is destined to lead the way, not only for our peoples, but also for humanity. And in order to begin to do this building on what has happened in the period since we started this program, I have a very rich panel uh, of people, a mixture of technocrats, of politicians, of administrators, of social movement leaders who will address the topic of values, principles, and policies for a sustainable management of Nigerian diversity. And the first panelist I'd like to call right here is His Excellency, the Governor of Edo State, Godwin Obasi. knew as uh, a cultural activist uh, from his time in Lagos. <laughs> was there, was, uh, I knew as a cultural activist and an entrepreneur and uh, more recently as a technocrat and then finally as a politician and public figure. Welcome to the panel. I'd like uh, to invite the President of the Nigeria Labour Congress, Comrade Ayuba Waba who has been, for the better part of his life, a militant in the struggle for the rights and the dignity of the working people of our country. Dr. Idayat Hassan. I've not seen Idayat. Idayat, yeah, Idayat Hassan, lawyer, activist, civil society leader, and current director of the Center for Democratic Development in West Africa. Currently, the Director General of the Imodo Institute of Labor Studies in Lori, former Secretary General of the Textile Workers Union of Nigeria, former Vice President of the NLC. So, you see, we have a very good and rich mix of people uh, on this panel. And uh, in the 40 minutes that have been allocated to us, I will be posing a number of lead questions. Um, just as uh, Anne did uh, before me, uh, in order to stimulate the conversation uh, amongst the panelists. Yeah. Also, hopefully, uh, the time allows us to be able to take a few uh, questions also of input uh, from the audience so that you can have an opportunity to interact. Two factors that make it difficult for us successfully to manage our that begs the question of whether, in fact, the prime issue that we need to deal with is not so much at the issue of the question of diversity management, which seems to be the symptom of something else, but a crisis of development management, which appears to be the underlying issue that throws open all of the 
any villages and contradictions that have made it impossible for us effectively to manage uh, aspects of our diversity. And I think as a uh, public figure uh, in the administration of our affairs in the country today, as somebody with a good uh, development experience, perhaps we can start with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Madita. Uh, let me appreciate and thank our President for this initiative and for also inviting me to participate in this dialogue. You are right. I'm like we gleaned from the previous panel. Diversity is half of human nature. There are very many countries and examples across the globe who have the same level of diversity as we do have, but have been able to make significant economic and developmental progress. So for us, we cannot continue to use diversity as an excuse for our development. Rather, we should now focus on these key values, what we need to do to address, as you said, the fundamental issues of development and utilize our diversity as an advantage or a tool in fostering our developmental goals. For me, I think the first thing to focus on is what I would term the competence of the citizen. Um, and I think one of the speakers in the previous panel spoke to, spoke to the issue of education. If we emphasize education as a new construct for our development in Nigeria, then we would have you know, made the first major move, particularly foundational education. If we continue to ignore the fact that more than 13 million children are out of school in this country, they will never see themselves as part of the country of Nigeria, and there will be tools in the hands of those who want to continue to argue and divide the country because of diversity. For most countries in the world, I think the set bottom is basic education, where a country, you know, that's the common denominator, that's the starting point for every citizen to understand the country, to understand their community of themselves, their communities, the country, and the meaning of the country to them and their communities, and how to relate to that person. So we attempted, we had several attempts as a country to get that common denominator, but unfortunately we have not been able to you know, proceed to the extent that we can. So yes, we do, we get our children through basic education, but they come out you know, I don't think they come out of the sort of citizens that we are trying to make sure. There are five mental issues, but let me just focus on those two. You know, the, the competence of the citizen and how we organize the states for development. And what do I mean by that? Um, every, every society, every country relies on a system to drive its governance. And that is the public service, the bureaucracy. To the extent that that, is, that structure, the institutions that make up the bureaucracy continue to be weak, then they will not be able to pursue all the policy actions that we decide on as a country to help you know, unify the country and to utilize these, the diversity we have as an advantage. Take for example, let us have a look at the issue of open grazing. As a country, we look at protein sufficiency. Today, the underlying issues, which are climate change and our uncontrolled demographics, are not the issues we're focused on. Rather, we see it as an issue of religion. We see it as an issue of uh, ethnicity. And to the extent that we do not have those instruments of states, 
and we do not have trust of citizens, we will continue to have these challenges in managing diversity. The important role of education, which is an issue which um, also was highlighted in the previous, in the previous uh, panel. And uh, I, I imagine that this also speaks to the broader socialization uh, process for Nigerians. I'd like to talk to you, uh, Commander Yudova. Um, as the leader of the NNC, you lead one of the major institutions of socialization uh, of Nigeria uh, into uh, the political development and social processes of the country. And we've not had a shortage of experience in the past of socialization. Earlier, our reference was made to see it. Um, there have been a whole host of other members uh, and agencies of those measures that have been put in place in the period since independence in 1960. What has worked? What has failed? What has exhausted its utility in terms of our ways of socializing citizens in Nigeria? Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Pro, uh, moderating this session. First, let me also thank uh, His Excellency for providing this platform to actually introduce some of those issues of our development, uh, particularly issues that pertain to democracy and the unity of the Nigerian state. Well, NLC as a pan-Nigerian organization uh, is an organization that is built on very clear ideological and uh, physiological uh, leading, uh, clearly about how we can advance not only democracy, not only the unity of the nation, but importantly also issues of governance. I think one of the issues that have dominated our engagement over the past uh, four decades is the issue of the economy and also the issue of our developmental challenges as a country. And I think the bottom line of the challenge of Nigeria today as a country is actually rested on those two fundamentals. And let me try to clear. One, there is no way you can have a peaceful, united country if we are not able to take care of our citizens. And there is no way you can take care of your citizens if you don't have a productive economy. An economy where you can produce your needs. An economy where there is certainty about people having a decent way of living. For the past 40 years, Nigeria is merely a trading post where we have commodities, we trade those commodities and use those resources to try to develop our economy. In many of the other jurisdictions where they have made headway, that have not been the case. The issue is about how do we add value to those resources that we have to be able to create the necessary jobs, the necessary social provisions that will bring, then bring about cohesion and unity. And the central issue of equal opportunity to all is also important because you can't build a viral system of democracy if there is no equal opportunity for everybody. His Excellency mentioned the issue of education, which I think is critical because an enlightened citizens cannot be manipulated, they will hold government accountable, and in doing that, you will have a viral society where then you will be able to build uh, the uh, moral values. You can be able to have people that actually believe in a particular ideology and philosophy, and uh, basically people can contribute to the development of their country. But because of those lacks in our system, which is due to the structural defects in the way and manner we have run the system, these have led to a lot of doubts and a lot of also divisions. Because there are stark, scarce resources, there are scarce employment opportunities, and therefore there is actually the issue of competition. And that's why our democracy certainly has not worked in a manner and way that can be able to take care of everybody. In many homes today, there is no certainty. Not many homes can have three meals per day. It's a fact. If we are really connected to the people, we will find out that fact. And there are many, as His Excellency said, that cannot assess quality education. Mandela has said it all. That the best way to address inequality in every society is to give quality education to the children of the world at all levels. And I think some of us that are in this world today that are more than 50 years, 
will attest to that fact. That no matter your standards, no matter the family value, the family system you come from, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, even my generation, we're able to have free quality education. At the end of your education, you are sure of a job. In fact, my generation, I'm just about 50. I was able to get a job, get a loan, get a house. At the end of the day, the house was free. Today, none of our children can be proud of such things. And therefore, those are the challenges. These are great challenges. Without social justice in any system, without shared prosperity, it will be difficult to have a country that is united. It will only be plurality. Plurality because you have people that have it, and you have people that don't have it. And clearly, part of the challenges we are passing through today, and look at regions where the quality of education is high. Crime rate is actually low. You can predict the type of crime rate that are, are available in those communities. And when you look at societies or states or regions where children of the poor have been deprived education, the crime rate there also, we know what it is. And therefore, clearly speaking, there are two issues we need to do very fast. One is the issue of addressing the gaps in our education and to make it compulsory at all levels. But importantly also is to strengthen the issue of a productive economy that can be able to address some of those challenges. There must be certainty. Uh, the two Britain Wood institutions have posited that by 2030, the population of Nigeria will be 410. So we are very good at producing people. Are we preparing for these people? The people we are will be producing. Are we actually planning for them? If we don't plan for them, then there is no way we can be dreaming of having a society that is united, a society that can actually be stable, and a society that can actually also compete with other economies. In other economies, they have developmental agenda that will be matched to their population. As the population is growing, infrastructure will be put in place. And all those amenities will be there, and therefore you are sure that you are not creating a system where you don't have certainty. So for me, those are the clear issues. Outside education is for us to add value to those commodities that God has given us freely, from petroleum to mineral resources to agriculture, freely God has given us. In fact, I can say that Nigeria is one of the best countries that is indoor in the whole world. And that is why, day in, day out, you see investors trying to come in. But those investors who will make them to make sure that they are also able to build those very clear gaps that we have in our system that can also assist in making sure that we have a system that is working for everybody. Thank you very much. And uh, you put a lot of emphasis on uh, ensuring that there is a productive base to the economy that enables us to be able to cater for citizen welfare uh, in a manner that will also promote uh, civic identities uh, over uh, parochial identities. Um, if I had to, you, you've worked on these issues both within Nigeria and across um, the West African sub region. Um, what exactly has been the obstacle towards achieving the kind of universality in social policy that can enable us to build national identity and empower citizens of the kind which are uh, Thank you very much. Actually, it will be very high level, but we have to go to the basics itself. And one thing we don't talk about often is the issue of partnership. Yes, public goods and services are important and they are actually needed for us uh, to be good citizens. But also, what is the communication, what is the relationship between the government and the government? How are citizens being engaged at every point in time? Where are there any kind of conversations that brings us together, even in the last couple of years? Maybe previously we used to have these uh, press briefings or press media chats as one way of engaging. But now we are no longer talking to each other, which actually allows for speculation. And if you want to zero it down and see what happens in other um, content. I think there are opportunities to engage. There are basic opportunities to engage and across the region we find many citizens are more engaged 
they are more engaged because they are not just being engaged on TV, they are being engaged at that local level. There are relationships either at the commune, relationships that is built at the local, uh, what we can call the local government level, where you get the opportunity to at least move with your elected representative, really is. Then maybe because politics is not even a zero sum as it is here in Nigeria, which makes it very difficult for me to say who my local government chairman really is. I don't know. But I'm sure if I'm actually from Guinea, in spite of the good data, people know who they are representative in that community. People engage with those representatives. And looking across the region, I think one thing I've also seen and I've learned is that if we go and launch a report, for instance, in Burkina, you would at least get a minister. In Togo, you can get the speaker without going the extra mile. And when they come, they are not made to sit, to sit like um, in the high table. They sit in the audience and they engage the same way. Um, if Professor Batili is here in Senegal, when we are having an event and we are the Minister for Good Governance, then he comes in and he sits with everybody and he engages. And they cannot leave half of the day, such that it has become a culture that you cannot even post anything in Senegal, for instance, and you don't bring the women parliamentarian into it. What kind of those micro culture have we developed in Nigeria up till we now start talking of the macro level at the highest? And I think one of the biggest challenges for us is the fact that we are not speaking to each other. We are not hearing from the elected leaders. And this allows for speculation. And it makes it very difficult to even build a uniform identity. Most times we talk about problems, problems, problems. Problem solving is another aspect of nation building. Because at every stage in time, problems will arise. The most important thing is how do we deal with that problem as part of our nation building exercise. The House of uh, Political Survey has part of a broader culture of uh, leadership engagement uh, in the process of uh, nation building. And uh, we'll stay with that thing politics and uh, political leadership. And I'll ask you, uh, Antonio, um, you just finished your tenure as a national commissioner. And in some countries around the world, the instrumentality of electoral um, systems is used to promote national identity formation and national formation. Um, is there something we need to do uh, in Nigeria? Our keynote speaker talked about reinventing political Parliament, inventing presidentialism, we need to invent our electoral system uh, as an instrument uh, that will build values of dignity, values of opportunity uh, in order to be able to achieve national cohesion. Yes, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, there's so much to do. Uh, the process has only recently begun, but there's still room for improvement. Uh, there are different uh, electoral systems all over the world. Uh, three major ones. You have the first past the post, majoritarian, and then the uh, uh, proportional representation. We have chosen or we currently practice the first past the post. And uh, it has uh, alluded to the zero sum nature of the first past the post. It is zero sum. It is called also winner takes all. Once I have taken everything, I don't need to bother with the people left behind. I don't need to bother with the people who put me there. I don't need to bother about living up to expectation in terms of delivery of the goods and services of the sustenance that the NLC president uh, alluded to. And I 
think that for me, especially as a political scientist, the keynote lecture that we have talks about the capture, if I should put it like that, the capture of the political party system. You know, the party system, uh, Professor Batili described it, is exactly the way it operates in Nigeria. I was um, uh, privileged to be in charge of the election and party monitoring department at the commission. And I see what happens. I see how names uh, come up overnight. I see how names are changed until we, we, we put the process of nomination to be technological. Uh, the, the process of submission of nominations, a name changes from the state capital to when it gets to Abuja. So there is no uh, feeling of uh, responsibility to the electorate. And as long as that is there, you know, as long as that is there, there would be no concern even for bringing about unity, for managing the process of diversity, whether it is, I mean, in, in the case of elections, you are talking about the people in your constituency. But within your constituency, there are different levels of diversity. How does an, an, uh, an elected representative feel a sense of responsibility to the electorate? There, there is no connection. That connectedness needs to return, needs to be back, needs to be strong. And that is the only way we can measure or manage our diversity. Then otherwise, democracy will not give us the unity that we are looking for. It will not give us the nation that we want. And at the end, if it doesn't give us, there will be no nation to rule over. So I think that as a country, we, need, we really need to do better. If we are keeping to first pass the post, there must be room for inclusion. There must be room for diversity. This is a great quality that we have and we need to manage it much better in order to make progress.
está faz dois dias muito as coisas de todo mundo não se ouve e mais pelo menos os estudos que lá estão a fazer esse investimento há um eu investi nas primeiras coisas que eu disse inclusive inclusive we talk so much about diversity of language, of regions, of states. Nobody talks of diversity of height. Uh, some of us are like bio compared to this excellency. I think maybe we also talk about diversity of height. But the word that is of interest to be with your excellency is that we ignore the diversity of class. Of class. And Nigeria is it's a highly divided society. It's a society in which you have so much education. So your invitation is extremely very, very symbolic that you've extended the invitation to an institute named after the iconic labor leader, Michael Imudu. You know, Michael Imudu was the grandfather or grand public of the labor movement, not just in Nigeria, but in Africa. He was a railway worker who challenged the British colonial exploitation in the railway system. And from there he became the first president of the National Union of Railway Union. And that set the tone for us today in which we have the largest, biggest labor movement in Africa. And it's a pleasure that President Amine Komen Ayuba is heading this NSC now with about 10 million uh, organized workers. Now, the point I'm raising here is that there was once in Nigeria, there was also a republic that worked very well for English. And I think I would like us to once again appreciate Professor Utali from the Senegal, who gave us the profoundest of the background. Please, a round of applause for him. And I think we should not ignore this way, because if we don't know where we are coming from, we will not know where we are going. Michael Nguyen Institute was established in 1983, formally commissioned by President Chief Shadow. And look at the vision of the final fighter. That institute was part of the fallout from the third development plan. And the whole idea is that if you are going to build a nation, if you have to make it as inclusive, you can have institutes that will give capacity for administrators, like ASCON or that thing. You can have institutes like a Center for Management uh, Studies or Development, you know, which is meant for managerial class. You can have issues of bankers, but it was also an institute to build capacity for the working class. I'm raising this point that we don't need to be agonizing people for solutions because there are the practical solutions that we give it, that you must have inclusive development. And that's why the Moody was established. It used to be very, very active for a recent time that got to obscurity. But we're back. Now that we want to be able to the forward. And the whole idea. As I want to put it to your excellency is that we must, and I think that's why the question you get is what are we teaching? How are we building the capacity for the working people within the institute? Now, we can't go beyond what is contained in our constitution. Interestingly, we have, we told the limitation of 1989 constitution. It's also a constitution that allows the constitution. If you take the Chapter 2, we deal with the fundamental objectives and objectives of, the, of uh, state policy. It's clear that you talk so in the need balanced society, you know, planned economy in which you don't concentrate the wealth of the nation in the hands of very few. So we deliberately make sure that we encourage knowledge about equity, about justice, of course. The need for productivity, very, very important. The need for fairness and justice. And I think this way this dialogue is very, very important because nobody can organize this kind of platform better than we need to do the work in that time, say, who have been very tested. It's not because you are here, I've said to several times that I've said to you that you are one of the well acknowledged labor friendly president to come from president and from, from this continent. Uh, I know what you went through before you signed the minimum wage to the law in 2010. You were under pressure of governments, state governments, who really were 
we did pressurize him not to sign for you. It was the situation you signed and you know Again, I know Brother Barry also went through the same pressure. 2019. And I think Governor Basic is here. One of the best governors, a round of applause for you who are going to be here. It's important for us to bring this point that our invitation is a total commitment to us. And you also promoted this social dialogue. Our if our social values which you talk about, basically to I don't think we should go anywhere by the Read our constitution very well. Chapter 2 talks of the national ethics. It talks of the principles, discipline, social justice, dignity of labor. You know, it's endless. The one I want to add on is state machine. Very, very important. We also need Pan Africanism because we are extremely very insular. And if I you and you, I mentioned maybe you, possibly by name, you would think that we are from the same But all these years, I met you more in Addis Ababa, I met you in Rwanda, in South Africa. That was to be where you, you have not, I don't think we mentioned it all. I mean, there was once a continent that brought us to this day. I was a friend from maybe in 1981, you know the story, for fighting with the students in the movie. And by my own member of my region, a northern leader known as Abu Abdullah, for fighting for justice. But it took a non northerner or if you want to use that category now, Professor Claude, I think it's a random faculty of the University of the who gave us admission in the Master of Portacos, where I've been challenged in 1985. This was the continent of Africa we live. I don't think we should be bogged down with ethnicity, with languages. I think we should be bogged down with development. We're already we are united by electricity poverty. We are united by uh, portals with banditry. I think it's time for us to get together to overcome this challenge. And that's the reason we have to do it. We only have to overcome banditry, portals, and lack of electricity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I, would, I would start rounding up um, shortly. And uh, I really do regret that we've not been able to have the interaction with the audience. But let me allow each of you, and I'd like to come back to you, uh, the Excellency Governor of Ocasa. In all of what we have heard today um, points to a shared desire to at least do something different and to um, dig into our um, collective genes to find ways in which we can introduce updated interventions for re-engineering our political system. You, as a city government, have been doing quite a number of things we can read about in the media. If there's one thing on the national scale that you would prioritize for the purpose of re-engineering our values, our principles, and the key policy directions uh, for building a stronger and more united Nigeria, what would that one thing be? And then I will go to Aruba all the other panelists, and I'm hoping that nobody repeats what you say uh, as the one priority in the set. Thank you. I'll say that what priority was a point made from the previous panel by the lady from Kenya, I believe. It's about including more women in our I've seen it work in my state. Uh, first, they are not more passionate. They are more concerned about the citizenry, about their people. When you go to a political rally, the first people that will be there are the women and they will have a little for art. We will give them assignments. Like two days ago, I hosted all the 36 chairmen of SPEM across the country. And looking around that table, it was only a new state that had a woman chairman of Sudan. That's why we were we been able to achieve what we've achieved with our adobes that is of the educational transformations. So to the extent that you can continue to exclude women or not, do not allow them the level of participation required, to that extent we're changing the democracy.
Thank you very much. The power we may build to better nation. Ayuba. Well, thank you, Prof. Uh, I think uh, one thing is very obvious. For political elites to be held accountable, the electoral process must be transparent. It must deliver a credible election. And that can only be done if we're able to strengthen the system. And that has been done. All countries around the world, we have governments are have held accountable, they have a good electoral system. If we're able to reform our electoral system and conform to the issue of one man vote, one woman one vote, and even link the voters' card to your national identity card number, many political elites that are up not to be politics will retire on their own because they know that they vote. That is the only way we can be able to address the mirage of challenges that is confronting us today because if democracy is government for the people by the people, then the, gov the, people, the government will also be accountable to the people. And the way they can be accountable is if, if, if the system is actually transparent. So when it's work in progress, we are not yet there. And therefore, I need a system that will be transparent. We are anybody that votes. I can go approach a system and say, Mr. A, B, C, D have voted. A, B, C, D have not voted. That will be a system that will work, and that will be a system that will address some of those issues that is confronted. Because from one, from the first dispensation to the dispensation, we have all our political dispensation. We have had challenges, and therefore, this is the only thing we can do to actually address those mirage challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. The electoral system for independence. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think what we need is an empowered citizen. An empowered citizen who knows the value of a vote. Citizen people would not sell their vote, we would have caught them, and this is a collective, is a collective effort from all of us. When they do, are not voting for stomach infrastructure, 1,000, 2,000 of that. We know vote means mandatory. You vote wrong, you know what's uh, bad rules, poor rules. That's just one part. But beyond this empowered citizenry at that point, who knows the value of the vote, the second aspect of the citizenry again will be one who also make their own vote count. So, mandate protection and election day. We are voting and we are watching our vote. And lastly, not just voting and staying through the scorching sun, holding elected government officials actually to account so that they can start delivering on everything that they have actually promised during the elections. Because I think that at this point, the quality of citizens will actually define the quality of democracy that we will actually enjoy as citizens. Thank you very much. Towards active citizenship in the building of the nation. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to uh, attend to the issue of the value system. And uh, before we get there, I want us to recall some of the words of our old national anthem. It says, though tribe and tongue may differ, in brotherhood, in sisterhood, we stand. I think that uh, people need to know that unless there's a nation, especially our elected officials, politicians, generally, unless there's a nation, we really can't lead, we can't uh, superintend anywhere. So it's very, it's very key for me. Thereafter, we must promote those old values of honesty, hard work, and discipline. A situation, somebody talked about our population. The population is not just big, getting too big, almost unmanageable, very soon, we know that that population is also characterized by a huge youth bulge. This is a youth uh, category. Most of them do not, no longer want to work. They don't believe in hard work. They don't believe in honesty. Just join politics, get somebody to promote you, and you are made it. That is not what we want. Lastly, for me, I think that in the and I mean tied to the issue of honesty is good and not extractive leadership. Leadership that will give good governance, not one that will take from the system. That I think is what we need. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting the city culture and identity. I think I will just briefly put it this way that I think it's 
time that Africans stop magnifying our shortcomings. I think we need to, yes, come with our shortcomings, but we won't be able to also amplify where we are making progress. And I'm happy to hear from you.